Shalom. Welcome to Ask JTF. This is the program in which we attempt to answer questions from our great JTFers. I'm Chaim Ben Pesach from the Jewish Task Force. Before we get to our questions, this program is dedicated to a refuah shlema, complete recovery, for Sharon Mitman, Shlomo Ben Sarah, and Dorit Bat Sarah, and to Ilui Neshamot, Elevating of the Souls, for Malka Bat Meir, Allegra Bat Shlomo, <coughs> Daniel Nankin, Victor Chazdai, Pesach Seb Ben Dov, Lunita Adler, Shifra Hoffman, Ruven Hoffman, Barry Hoffman, Harab Mir Kahana, Harab Binyamin Kahana, Tsipora, Fegi Bat Liba, Yosef Ben Meir, Robert Mitman, Dennis Shore, Helen Friedman, and Charles Zolat. <clears throat> and I want to speak to you about just how essential the work we're doing for the Hilltop Youth is to the survival of Israel. Judea and Samaria are the biblical heartland of Israel. Israel liberated Judea and Samaria in the 1967 Six-Day War. It was a miracle. If Israel surrenders Judea and Samaria and a so-called Palestinian state is created, it would be national suicide for Israel. Israel would be in boundaries that are only six to nine miles wide. We've said this many times, and of course there is no Palestine, there are no Palestinians, all of that is a lie. The question is, are the hilltop youth really essential to the battle to save Judea and Samaria? You bet they are. A new study was just done by someone who who points out statistics that that uh, we can see on the ground. And the statistics show the following. Number one, about 60% of Judea and Samaria is so-called Section C, under the Oslo Accords. Sections A and B have already been given to the Arab terrorists. That means 40% of Judea and Samaria was already handed over and completely surrendered to the Arab terrorists. So they already have 40% in their hand before we even start calculating what happens with the final 60%. And then out of the 60%, because they are illegally building in Section C, which they're not allowed to do, because they, with the support and financial support of the Arab League and Arab countries and the European Union and self-hating Jewish billionaires like George Soros, with their massive funding and massive building campaign, <coughs> campaign going on on the ground in Section C, all of it illegal, but the Israeli government and the Israeli army do nothing to stop them. Nothing. And they're blat blatantly breaking every law and every agreement that was signed. And the Israeli government and the Israeli authorities do nothing to stop them. When they build illegally, that's their land now. It becomes their land automatically, even though they stole every, every inch of that land. And they've already taken 30% of Section C. 30% out of 60% is 18% of the total. So they now control 58% of Judea and Samaria already. That's in their hands right now, 58%. And with their massive illegal building on a daily basis, they're going to gobble up all of Judea and Samaria if we don't stop them. What about the Jews that are in Judea and Samaria, that are there to settle the land and to keep the land for the Jewish people. There are Jewish settlements, big, huge settlement blocks, large established settlements with hundreds of thousands of Jews there. And then there are 400, roughly 400 heroic, noble Jewish Maccabees called the Hilltop Youth. Four, just four, about 400 roughly on, on, very, on Hilltop communities. What's the situation there? Well, Let's look at the statistics. A half a million Jewish settlers live in only 2.5% of Judea and Samaria because they immediately build, build big buildings and, and all types of structures and then fence themselves in. And that's it. So they're only 2.5% of Judea and Samaria. They can't save. The, the settlements there are not going to save Judea and Samaria. That's not going to do it. We, we will have a so-called Palestinian state even with hundreds of thousands of Jews living there because they're fenced in and boxed in to 2.5% of Judea and Samaria. And we can easily have a so-called Palestinian state in 90% of Judea and Samaria even with hundreds of thousands of Jews living there. And if, the, if they get 90% of Judea and Samaria plus the other territory that the Israeli government has promised them and that the world community is demanding for them, Israel is in suicidal boundaries. 
suicide, God forbid. And that can lead to a holocaust, God forbid. And so they're just 2.5%, the Jews who live in their little boxed-in communities. Plus, in addition to that, they also have agricultural communities and farming which, carry, which does have some more land there and, and, and some factories and industrial areas. Their total, the total Jewish settlement presence in Judea and Samaria is 10% of Judea and Samaria, just 10%. That's what they control right now, only 10%. And they may get kicked out of, and they may get kicked out of that 10% the way things are going. What about the Hilltop Youth? The Hilltop Youth, though, have broken out of that 10% and out of those boxed-in, boarded-up settlements and have said, no, this land is ours. We don't accept the fact that Jews are not allowed to live in their own land and that we're going to surrender this land to the Muslim Nazi terrorists who promised to exterminate the Jewish people. We're not going to accept that. Jews have a right to settle everywhere in their historic biblical homeland. That's what the Hilltop Youth are saying. You know that these 400 young Jews in the Hilltop Youth control 7% of Judea and Samaria because they immediately, when they have a hilltop, a little hilltop, even with just a few Jews living there, they right away start grazing land and start putting out and, and start and start building building roads or building things to try to, building something to, to, to for, for and, and, and start cultivating the land and starting agricultural cultivation. <laughs> Can you believe this? 7% of Judean Samaria is in the hands of just 400 Jews because they spread out all over the place. A lot of that is with JTF's money. Baruch Hashem, what a, wow, wow, boy has Hashem given us an opportunity here to do something amazing and miraculous. I mean, we are literally affecting the very future destiny of the Jewish people. And so, they control 7% and a half a million Jews control only 10% total and they control 7%. 400 Jews. <laughs> Can you believe this? Imagine if those half a million Jews were all like the Hilltop Youth. If half a million Jews were all like the Hilltop Youth, the Mashiach would come already. We'd have the final redemption already if we had those types of if we had those types of tzaddikim, those types of unbelievable, righteous, saintly Jewish idealists if we had hundreds of thousands of them and just, instead of a few hundred, the Mashiach would come already. Now you may say, okay, but there are only 400. Maybe the Israeli army will come in and throw them out. And the Israeli army has been destroying their homes and they've been fighting and they rebuild and the Israeli army comes and destroys and they rebuild and so on and so forth. What's the, well, 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 what's the point of all of this? If that 7% wasn't there, if, they, if, they hadn't, if the Hilltop Youth didn't have that 7%, there would be a Palestinian state already. All they'd have to do is declare it, because on the ground you'd have one already. Because that 7% prevents a contiguous territorial flow for a Palestinian state connecting all the Arab Nazi communities in Judea and Samaria. They can't connect everything because those hilltop communities cut them up and prevent it. That 7% is the blockade right now, is the number one obstacle to a so-called Palestinian state right now. That's 7%. You remove that, the Arabs will immediately come in and seize that land illegally, but nobody stops them. They, they, we've seen already, nobody's going to stop them. They'll come in and take the land right away. And they have a Palestinian state in their hands already. And it's over. It's over without the hilltop youth. That's why that's the first thing that the that all of our enemies, the Arabs, the State Department, the European Union, the UN, the the left wing, the the left wing self hating Judenrat Kapo Jewish Nazis from Shalom Achshav and all these from Peace Now and all these other Jewish Nazi organizations. These are Jewish Nazis who want to kill their fellow Jews. The first thing they demand is remove the hilltop youth communities. That's the first thing they demand. Why are they so worried about 400 people? Because they're in the key 7% with the hilltops. And, the, and they don't want 7%. They want to expand and move beyond that to prevent the Arabs from continuing their illegal building. Where the hilltop youth are, there's no Arab building.
The hilltop youth are the only ones standing in the way. And let me tell you something. A very, very large percentage, maybe even most, but a very large percentage of their money comes from JTF. So you have a way to directly... I mean, you've never had a cause so good as this. All your money, all your money, 100% of it will go to helping these wonderful people. All of it, 100% of our budget is devoted to this. And yes, we've given them hundreds of thousands of shekels in the past six or seven months. Uh, you know, comes to maybe between one hundred fifty and two hundred thousand dollars, something like that. Maybe more. Actually, it's probably more. We've given them over two hundred thousand dollars because we have JTFN, we have VJA, it, we've given them over $200,000 in the past, if, you, if you're not measuring it in shekel, if you're going to measure it in dollars, it's over $200,000 in the past six or seven months. $200,000, you know what a joke that is? These organizations have people, have, have people, these Jewish establishment organizations have people in their organizations that make millions, their salary is millions, just their salary, what they put in their stinking greedy pockets is millions. Mort Klein, you know how much money he gets from the ZOA, the so-called Zionist Organization of America, and from his and from the Arabs who are funding the ZOA, Arabs, enemies of the Jewish people who hate the Jews and want to destroy Israel, are funding the ZOA too. He gets money from them as well. What a joke this is! What a what a what a commentary this is on our generation. On the one hand, you have these noble, magnificent Jewish heroes, and on the other hand, you have a Jewish community that won't even give them financial support, except for the couple of hundred thousand that that we were able to raise for them in the past half year. We need to find more support for them. Because we're the ones on the ground that are making a difference here. We're the only ones, the only ones that are offering an answer to the Arab threat. Because all the Jewish settlements, if you give to a Jewish settlement, the Jewish settlements is going to continue to build within that 2.5% where the Jews live, and then they have 7.5% for their agriculture and their, and their factories. Yeah, but even that, the agriculture and the factories, the Arabs can gobble that up quickly too. The one place where they don't gobble up is where the hilltop youth are. The hilltop youth will fight them off. The hilltop youth are fighters. <clears throat> They're like the boy holding his finger in the dam to prevent the flood. What heroes. And JTF is the only organization outside of Israel that supports them. The only organization that sends financial support to them outside of Israel. No other organization in the world supports them Outside, outside of Israel. In Israel itself, they raise money for themselves. They have their own fundraising activities in Israel itself. But outside of Israel, we're the only ones raising money for them. Just us. I don't know what they do without us. They have columns. They have columns that they write thanks to us. They have highways that they've built and roads that they've built thanks to us they have tractors and pickup trucks and and all types of things and Torah learning they're learning Torah on the hilltops teaching Torah to, the, to which is essential absolutely essential if we're going to win this victory <clears throat> and JTF if JTF wasn't there a lot of these things, most of these things wouldn't happen. Do you realize now why it is so essential that we succeed here? It's the same story as it was with Soviet Jewry, when JDL was the only organization that really pushed the issue in a way that, that seriously made a difference. And it's the same as it was in the days of Etzel and Lechi fighting to throw the British out of the land of Israel and free the land of Israel. Again, small minority of Jews fighting against the against the odds to create a Jewish state with most of the Jews against them. 
same story again, history repeating itself again. Which side are you on in this historic battle? That's the question. Everybody out there, every one of you can afford to give something. And every one of you, you can do something to promote JTF, to help us spread the word, help us promote JTF. Very, very important. And by the way, uh, before I give you how you can help, you know, the two ways that you can help, I just want to answer one of the questions here. I'm going to answer out of order because the question is so important that it involves the Hilltop Youth. Uh, because there's something else happening with the You know what? Let's first put, put on, let's first put on the, uh, show people how they can support JTF. Let's, let's start off with that. If you want to support JTF, there are two ways that you can do it. And when I say support JTF, I mean support the Hilltop Youth. There are two ways you can do it. And 100% of our budget goes to the Hilltop Youth. 100%. The first way you can support is by going to our Hebrew main page, which is hayamin.org. You just go to hayamin.org. And there's a donate button on top. You click on the donate button. And in several minutes, you can very easily and conveniently either donate a one-time donation. You can give a one-time donation. Or you can do recurring donations. We, we, we automatically do a recurring donation. You you, you're automatically will, 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 will be donating every month to JTF or to, to, to VJA. In this case, it's VJA, the Voice of Jewish Activism. And by the way, your donations to the Voice of Jewish Activism, to VJA, are tax deductible, are tax exempt. So that's one way you can do it. That's if you want to do it online. The other way to do it is through the regular mail. You just send checks and money orders made out to JTF, and you send it to JTF, P.O. Box 650327, Fresh Meadows, New York, 11365, JTF, P.O. Box 650327, Fresh Meadows, New York, 11365. And I'm not finished with the Hilltop Youth. I'm going to answer now one of our questioners, the great Ron, who is, happens to be our representative in Israel, uh, asks a question that, that is so essential that I have to ask out of order. I have to make him the first, give him the first answer because it's, it's an emergency situation. You'll see why when I answer the question. It's absolutely essential. So I'm going to answer Ron's question right away because of the urgency of the situation. Ron, um, from Israel, who is, again, who is our, our great representative in Israel, and who he himself, by the way, Ron himself is a Jewish hero, and Ron himself is uh, just, I mean, he's a Jewish hero, let's put it that way, in every respect, and he does so much for us. He's just a, a, a really, really someone that that all of us should should admire and respect to the utmost. Ron writes, and I and, and I quote, Shalom Chaim. Please comment on the recent Arab riots in the Shimon HaTzadik neighborhood in Jerusalem. Thanks and God bless you, Ron. Okay, that's his question, and let me give you a little background. Shimon HaTzadik is a neighborhood in Yerushalayim, in Jerusalem, our capital, our eternal capital, in the middle of the city. You know, without Jerusalem, we don't have any business being in Israel at all, if we don't have Jerusalem. I mean, the the Jews did not pray, did not turn to Tel Aviv three times a day to pray, when when they were, when for 2,000 years they were in the Galut and millions were murdered dreaming of returning to Israel. They dreamed of returning to Yerushalayim. I'm not saying Tel Aviv is not, I'm not saying Tel Aviv and the rest of Israel is not important. It's important. But Yerushalayim is the heart of the land of Israel. And in this neighborhood, in the heartland, the biblical, in, in the heartland, not in the heartland of Israel, in the heart of the heart and soul of the Jewish people is Jerusalem. In this land, the Arabs are waging a terrorist campaign nonstop to throw the Jews out of that neighborhood. There are, again, the Jews are outnumbered and fighting a heroic battle to stay there. About a week ago, they burned a Jewish family's home. 
They firebombed the home and the entire home was burned, completely burned. The Jewish family, it was a ness, it was a miracle. The Jewish family was not there at the time. If they had been there, all the Jews, the Jews, the husband, wife, and the children would all have been burned to death, God forbid, would all have been murdered. So they were saved by a miracle, but the Arabs attempted to murder them and did burn their house down. Their car, they keep getting, they keep getting new used cars, that's all they can afford, you'll see why in a moment. Their car has been burned and destroyed nine times. They have a car, nine times it has been burned and destroyed by the Arab Nazi terrorists in Jerusalem. Arab Nazis beat and attack Jews in Jerusalem constantly. You can't walk, you can't leave your home, you can't walk the street, you can't do anything. The Arab Muslim Nazis beat, attack, and terrorize the heavily outnumbered Jews there. And the police do nothing. Nine times someone's car is burned and the police did nothing. Their, their home was burned and they were nearly murdered and the police do nothing. Nothing! If someone scratches the finger of an Arab, the police launch a major investigation into it. But... Arabs murdering Jews, beating Jews, firebombing their homes, burning their homes down, burning their cars. This is not, this doesn't warrant serious police protection or police action. That shows you what the Israeli police and the Israeli government and the Israeli establishment are all about. And it's not just this government, the prior government under that animal, Bibi Netanyahu, were just as bad. And in, and in some cases, even worse. We're losing Jerusalem, the middle, the middle of, this is the middle of the capital of the state of Israel. We're losing Jerusalem. This is a neighborhood that is within walking distance of of of, of the Western Wall of the Holy Temple, where the Holy Temple was. We're losing Jerusalem. The only people who have come in to guard the Jews and protect the Jews are the hilltop youth. They've come from the hilltops. They've come into the city in Jerusalem and they're protecting and guarding the Jews. And get and all of a sudden when the hilltop youth come, the police suddenly become active against the hilltop youth. The hilltop youth are just trying to protect the Jews there and the police arrest and attack and beat the hilltop youth. The Arabs start riots and, and want to attack the hilltop youth. The hilltop youth come to defend. Police do nothing against the Arab rioters. Arab riots, that's fine. The hilltop youth, they're the ones that the police focus their brutality and sadism on. This is in the middle of the capital, the eternal capital, not only of the state of Israel, but of the Jewish people, the heart and soul of the Jewish people, the eternal heart and soul of the Jewish people, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem. The hilltop youth, they're the Jews we can be proud of in this generation. And Jews who don't support them should be ashamed of themselves and, and will hang their head in shame on the day of judgment. Hashem will judge them and they'll hang their head in shame. We better support the hilltop youth and we better do everything we can to, to defend the land of Israel because this is a battle for Jewish survival. Okay, now let's get to the other questioners for this week. And we're going to go to, we're going to start off with Binyamin Yisrael, um, our, our great friend who writes, and I quote, one, discuss the following blacks, Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was a black abolitionist, in other words, he was active during the days of slavery and he was a writer and an orator against abolition and he was half white, by the way. You know, the ones with the brains are usually half white. Obama, I mean, I don't think Obama was a genius, but, you know, he was also half white. Let's not forget that. Okay? Uh, a lot of the people who are the leaders and the ones pushing and the, the ones who can make the best speeches and do the best writing are... You, you know, usually have a lot of white blood in them. Take that any way you want it. 
politically incorrect. Politically incorrect is a fact. Okay? Anyway, that was Frederick Douglass. And then uh, Benjamin asked me about Harriet Tubman. He has a list of various blacks in his question. Harriet Tubman. Uh, she helped free uh, slaves. She had a, what was called the underground, I forgot what they call it, the... Uh, she helped free slaves by bringing them from from the slavery in the south to the north to the so-called free states and so now they want to put her on the twenty dollar (laughs) bill she belongs on a twenty dollar bill because of that anyway uh, this whole country is finished and now Benjamin asked me about Malcolm X Malcolm X is an example of what happens when you free the slaves Malcolm X is the hero in the black community. Malcolm X Boulevard in Harlem, they name streets after him. They they all honor him. The Hollywood does movies honoring him. Books are written glorifying him. Malcolm X, a rapist, a drug dealer who sold dope, poison to his fellow blacks to make money, and a homosexual prostitute. That's the big hero in the black community. The guy who ran around saying, you white-eyed devils. <laughs> yeah, you white-eyed devils. <laughs> he used to call white people white-eyed devils. And then in the end, he really became very involved with Islam. He found Islam, went to Saudi Arabia, and became very involved with, with, with the Muslims and with the Muslim world. Uh, and of course, with the commitment to destroy Israel. Always hating whites, hating Jews, and being a very devout Muslim. This is the big hero in the black community. And by the way, you know, don't ask me why I'm not fond of of blacks, generally speaking. I'm not fond of people who hate my people, especially people who would be, who would have nothing if not for the Jews. The Jews were the brains behind the civil rights movement. The Jews were the brains behind everything that they achieved. And the next person that Benjamin asked me about is Elijah Muhammad. Mm-hmm. Elijah Muhammad was, was one of the leaders of the nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. And he the one he'd be the one that said that there is a spaceship called the mothership flying over the earth. Mm-hmm. And the mothership, Elijah Muhammad created the spaceship. Mm-hmm. He a great scientist. He'd be a great scientist. He don't know how to read or write, but he a scientist. And Elijah Muhammad said that when Allah give the signal, the whole white devil race is gonna be sucked up into that spaceship. Mm-hmm. Ain't gonna be no white. Ain't gonna be no white folk left. Mm-mm. You white devil, you all gonna get killed. We gonna suck you up in that spaceship and destroy you. Mm-hmm. That's Elijah Muhammad. And then. Benjamin asks about Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan, who also believes in the spaceship and and so on. And Louis Farrakhan, of course, who made the famous statement, I like when the Jews call Farrakhan Hitler. Hitler was a great man. Hitler was a very great man. And Farrakhan says that all whites are devils and will be exterminated. Can you imagine if you had a white guy running around saying all blacks are devils and will be exterminated? Do you think that they would have million man marches for him and all the members of Congress, all the white members of Congress would go to his demonstrations and support him and have covenants with him the way all the black members of Congress support Louis Farrakhan? You think that would happen? Barack Hussein Obama, who was president of the United States for two terms and was elected by a majority of the American people, went to Louis Farrakhan's Nazi Million Man March. Barack Hussein Obama took a photograph with Farrakhan, smiling and shaking his hand. That was what was in the White House. And now Benjamin asks, too, do do you have an affirmative action story that took place at LaGuardia Airport? Also, say if it was before or after September 11, 2001. Uh, No, I don't remember anything affirmative action story that might be I probably I can't think of it right now I can't think of anything from LaGuardia Airport Benjamin to be honest with you uh, 
I really, I really can't think of anything. Maybe there was, I just don't remember right now. And then Benjamin asked, was last week's story from, from JFK, JFK is the other airport in New York City, before or after September 11, 2001? It was after September 11, 2001. Thank you, Benjamin. And now we go to the great Hirvatsky Noachai, who writes, and I quote, It appears that the main traditional Jewish commentators of the Hebrew Bible, uh, e.g. Uh, Rashi, Ramban, Sforno, are not included in the prohibition of Gentiles learning Torah in depth. I learned the whole to- Torah with Rashi's commentary, but not with Ramban and Sforno. How do their commentaries differ from Rashi? Oh, um, <clears throat> first of all, all three of them are unbelievable geniuses. Unbelievable geniuses. <laughs> brilliant beyond, beyond, beyond my ability to describe how brilliant they are. Um, Haramban was more of a visionary. He did, he did commentary on the entire Bible as did Rashi and as did Sforno, but Ramban was more of the visionary. Um, And, well, first let me give a a little bit of a brief history of what's going on here. Um, Rashi lived about 950 years ago. Of course, his entire lifetime. I'm just saying 950, 900 years ago, you know, his lifetime, you you know. I think he was uh, about my age when he passed away, unfortunately. I'm I'm 65 years old. I think he was about 65. He was about my age when he passed away. He was a French Jew, even though he lived um, for a decade in in Germany in order to study in the the yeshivas in Germany, in in the yeshiva world there. And he was the ultimate bi- biblical scholar and genius. Uh, in Hebrew we say gaon. Gaon means a genius. He called his interpretation simple. Pashut in Hebrew. But they weren't simple by any means. They were, they were very deep and, and very compelling. His style would be, to he-, he would heavily quote Chazal. Chazal are the rabbinic sages from before him, from the Talmud. He would quote Chazal very heavily, and but he would do it in a way where you know, because Chazal, you have all these different rabbis comment, all these rabbinic sages commenting on every single word, on every single phrase in the Bible. He would put it all together, and then give his own commentary and and, and show what it what it means and, and what the real meaning is, brilliantly, and did it so brilliantly, magnificently. Um, so he made studying, Rashi made studying the Bible, and study, and even studying the Talmud, because he did commentary on the Talmud as well. Uh, he made studying it far more, um, far more, far more practical and 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 far easier for us to to do. Uh, you know, I'm not saying Rashi is necessarily easy, but he made it he made it much easier than it was. He simplified it to a certain extent. I, I hate to use the word simplify, but he made it so that we could study in an organized, brilliant, rational, logical way all these different commentaries. He put it all together and, and showed us what the meaning is with the help of the rabbinic sages. That was his style. Haramban also did that but Haramban also was was a visionary, and so he was a heavy believer in, for instance, Gilgul Neshamot Haramban. Gilgul Neshamot is reincarnation. He believed that soul. He believed that we come with the, that if if you fail in your first time in this world, you can come back again and be reincarnated. And Haramban lived seven hundred or. 750 to 800 years ago, something like 750 to 800 years ago. So he lived, um, you know, about uh, uh, 150 to 200 years after Rashi. He was forced to debate in Barcelona in Spain. The Christian 
Jew haters there forced him to debate, the Catholic Jew haters. They forced him to debate um, on whether or not you can prove the existence of Jesus and the Jesus being the Messiah. If you can prove it from from the Talmud, he was that was the subject that they forced him to debate with a self-hating Jewish trader who contended that that you even see in the Jewish Talmud, you even see rabbis writing about things that show that that show that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, which is complete nonsense. And Haramban easily defeated him in the debate, easily defeated him, and then had to flee for his life from Spain. This was in Spain. He had to flee from his life because they were going to kill him. Because he, he, he you know, he, he humiliated the the the, the self hating Jewish uh, apostate, the self hating Jewish convert, who was debating on behalf of the church. Haramban, because of the time that he lived in, and the very heavy persecution of the Jews at that time, focused heavily on refuting Christianity as well in his writings. So a lot of it is ref- refutations of Christianity, and you'll see you'll see a lot of hints of that if you read his uh, his commentaries on the Torah and on, on the Tanakh. Um, you also see that, by the way, in Rashi. You see some of that with Rashi because the first crusade, the, the the Crusades actually started pretty much toward the end of Rashi's life. Uh, the Crusades started where where many huge numbers of Jews were brutally brutally murdered during the Crusades. They were ordered by the Catholic Church. Um, the third person you mention here is Hasforno. Hasforno, and I'm putting the word ha in front of the word sforno. Hasforno. Hasforno means the sforno. But, you know, he's referred to as sforno. He's also referred to as Hasforno. Hasforno, he lived about 450 to 500 years ago, so he lived hundreds of years after um, after Rashi and uh, Haramban. He quotes, uh, he frequently quotes Rashi and he frequently quotes others, Sforno, so there's a lot of quotes there. One thing that he did, he tried to interpret in a way, Sforno, if you read his interpretations, in a way that the average person could understand. He didn't appeal to the elites or he didn't appeal to the great rabbinic scholars because, yeah, very hard to, if you're reading stuff that's for the rabbinic scholars, it's very hard to do if you're not a rabbinic scholar. So Sforno was more... He wanted the average person to be able to understand what his commentary was all about, and he appealed to them and tried to interpret in a way where the average person would 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 comprehend what he's what 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 he's writing. So that's just a brief overview of some of the differences and some of the styles, some of the stylistic um, some of the stylistic attributes of these three great rabbinic scholars. Thank you very much, Hirvatsky. And now we go to Ram Sheva Sheva Efes, who writes, and I quote, Shalom Chaim, uh, okay, I'm going to be reading in Hebrew. This is going to take only a couple of minutes. You don't have to run away because I'm reading in Hebrew. I'm going to read in Hebrew and I'm going to translate uh, and answer as quickly as possible here. Shalom Chaim Hayakar, Mashlom Cha, Madad Cha, Alzeh, Ishit, שהיהודים הרשאים מבריטניה אמרו לבצלאל סמוטריץ' לך אתה לא רצוי כאן וגם מה דעתך לגבי מפגש הזום בעוד שבוע ב-24 לחודש אני אביא את דוב um, הלברטל שהוא יהודי טוב וצדיק שהפך משמאלני לימני הוא um, באופן אישי היה באזכרה השנה של הרב כהנא זצל, השם יקום דמו. האם זה בסדר שזה יהיה מפגש זום של שאלות משותף של שניכם? לא, זה לא בסדר, רם. כי אתה אמרת לי ש, שזה יהיה הזום שלי. <laughs> לא מגיע לי זום עם, עם, עם מה שאני רוצה להדגיש, עם מה ש... לא, לא. אם אתה רוצה לעשות את זה בסדר, תעשה את זה איתו. אני לא, אני לא אבוא. כי אמרת לי שזה, שזה יהיה זום בשבילי כדי לדבר על, על נוער הגבעות, זה מה שאני רוצה. זה מה שאני רוצה. אם, זה לא, אם, אם אתה לא רוצה לעשות את זה, אין, אין לי בעיה, אבל לא, אני לא מוכן לעשות את זה ככה. אני, יש, יש נושאים שחשובים לי. 
what I told Ram, Ram wants to, he asked me about Zoom, and he asked me about various other subjects, about the Jews in Britain, um, telling uh, a Knesset member, uh, Betzal Smotrich, that he's not welcome there. Uh, these left-wing Jews and there's something called the Board of Deputies, which are left-wing traitors. Um, and so I'm just basically telling him that, you know, we're discussing the Zoom that's going to be coming up where we're, 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 we're going to be doing a Zoom on the 24th of this month, uh, God willing, Bezrat Hashem, uh, to discuss the Hilltop Youth and other subjects. Agav, Gabay, Betzel, Smotrich, Ram, Kamovan, She, She, Hayirgun, Haze, Shel, Hayyudonim, Ayele, Imash, Mamba, Zechram, Hem, Reshaim, Bogdaniim, She, Achraim, Yahad, Imod, Bogdim, La Shoa, Ki, Hayala, Hem, הייתה הם הרבה השפעה במשך השואה, והם לא עשו כלום כדי להציל את היהודים בשואה. ימח שמם וזכרם. And now Ram writes, uh, and I quote, אשמח שנדבר שוב בפרטי לגבי סירוב העלייה שלך, אתה חייב להגיע כבר לארץ ישראל, אני אישית לא אספיק לנסות לעזור לך. מה דעתך um, לקשר בין Ron Mehaforum Levain Udi Vertman Yosef Rabin Uben Sion Gagula Haim Ata Be'ad Be'avat Yisrael Ram Meir Avraham And Ram is asking me if I can we can make contact between Ron from our organization and from the forum and various people that he knows uh, yeah, which I don't have any objection to uh, right now Ron, Ron is extremely extremely busy אין לי שום בעיה עם זה, אם, אם, רון, אם רון מוכן לעשות את זה, אבל אני חייב לומר לך, רם, שרון עסוק, כל כך עסוק, עם כל מה שהוא עושה למען הגבעות, ועם כל מה שהוא עושה בשבילנו, הוא כל כך עסוק, אני לא יודע אם הוא ימצא את הזמן uh, להתעסק בזה כעת. אבל אנחנו לא פוסלים, בטח בעתיד, את האפשרות. Thank you very much, uh, רם. And now we go to our good friend Joe Gutfeld, who writes, and I quote, Shalom Chaim, what do you think about the spike of crime in New York City as well as the shooting of police officers ever since Biden took over? Um, do you also see a red wave for the midterm election? Unquote. Um, I don't think that it's just because of Biden. I, I don't think it's just because of Biden. Taking over that there's a, a shooting, the shooting of police officers. There was a spike in crime when when Donald Trump was president. Crime started going up when Donald Trump was president. I think Joe Biden is also a terrible president. I think he's a terrible leader and 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 also uh, someone who who has not addressed these problems in a serious way. But New York City has been going downhill for years now, for many years. New York City's been going downhill. So it's that's this, you know, if you let black, racist, Jew-hating scum roam the streets, you let them out of the cage and you let them roam the streets freely, this is what's going to happen. Because that's the vast majority of cases, that's who's doing this. And and that that's what's going to happen. And as far as uh, a red wave, which means, in other words, Republican victories in the midterm elections, I think the Republicans are going to win the midterm elections, yes. I think they're going to win. I think that the American people don't like what's going on, and I think that they're going to vote Republican as a protest. Uh, I just don't think the Republicans are honest either. But I do think Americans will be voting Republican in order to show their their dissatisfaction and dislike for what the, what the Biden White House is doing. Thank you, Joe. And now we go to Eliezer, who writes, and I quote Shalom Chaim. One, can you please comment on the death of Afro-giant Colin Powell? In his obituary, he said that he was fully vac- vaccinated and died from COVID. Do you think it will count as a mitzvah for him that in his death he showed us that the vaccine isn't working, unquote? Ain't working, unquote. No, I don't think so, because he had he had underlying causes, very serious diseases and underlying causes, extremely serious diseases and underlying causes. And that's why he was one of the breakthrough cases. And the reason why he died and the reason why millions have died and that this thing goes on is because ignorant, insane people who don't know how to read simple statistics and who have zero logic and zero brains are refusing to take this vaccine and are spreading lies about it. And because of that, this this thing goes on. Okay? 
over 90% of the people being hospitalized and over 90% of the people dying are the unvaccinated, even though they're only 20% of the population. So people who can't read simple statistics and understand simple statistics, they're the ones who are bringing this curse on all of us. And Eliezer now writes, and I quote too, how many times do you think it will take for the vaccine to kick in and start working? You just did shot number three, and in Israel they're up to shot four or five. What are the chances that the COVID virus is like a flu where every season people get a flu shot and get sick anyway because of a different mutation of the flu, unquote. People do not get sick anyway because of the flu shot. The flu shot prevents a lot of people from getting the flu. And if they get it, they get a milder case of the flu because of the flu shot. I suppose you'd be opposed to the polio shot, the polio vaccine. Millions of children were being crippled by polio before the polio vaccine came out. I guess you'd be against another vaccine. It's the same same exact thing as what we're talking about here, along with many other vaccines. I guess you'd be against the shots for syphilis and for gonorrhea and for all types of things that have been cured. I guess you'd be against penicillin. I suppose you're against all of those things. After all, uh, it's all the same science and the same, you know, same statistics and same science. Uh, you know, this is the, you know, there are people that are fighting against science and it's just pure insanity. And the problem is they're bringing this curse on all of us. They're the ones who are primarily being victimized by their own by their own insane behavior. They're being victimized more than anyone else because of the, 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 the statistics show that they're the vast majority of very sick, of long COVID, of, of deaths. The vast majority are the unvaccinated. But they still bring this upon people, upon innocent people upon innocent people who do get vaccinations. People who are unvaccinated are not innocent. Are not innocent. They're bringing this plague on all of us. And let's go on now to the next uh, questioner, which is Yimach Shmoda Islam, our great friend, who writes, and I quote, Dear Chaim, why do black people often use double negatives? Unquote. Um, because they don't know how to speak English. And and because their life is a double negative, I mean they they just they 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 you know <clears throat> they don't they don't understand grammar and they don't know how to speak English. They live here four hundred years and still don't know how to speak English. The Jews came to this country not speaking a word of English and for terrible poverty, lived in terrible poverty. And look what look what happened to the Jews in one generation. Look at the geniuses. Asians who come here. <laughs> Asians who come here speaking Chinese and Korean and all these other languages that have n- no similarity to English in any respect. Completely different in every way. Their children already are scoring higher than white than white kids in colleges and universities. How come they're able to make it? But blacks are here 400 years and they still don't know how to scratch their tuchas? Thank you, Yamach Shmoda Islam. And now we go to Chicago Jew, our good friend, who writes, and I quote, Shalom Chaim, please give me your opinion on these former Israeli prime ministers and why you don't like them. Uh, Shimon, and we have Shimon Perez, Ehud Barak, Ariel Sharon, Ehud Olmert. All four of them. Um surrender Jewish land and, or, or were determined to surrender Jewish land. All four of them wanted Israel to commit national suicide. All four of them. All four of them broke the law, were all corrupt, all evil people. Uh, Ehud Olmert actually went to jail for several years for breaking for, for, for his corruption. And what he went to jail for was just bribery and stealing, which is nothing compared to the... I mean, he, many Jews were murdered because of his policies. So he, sh- he, sh- he should have been given the death penalty because he has Jewish blood on his hands. And Arik Sharon, the same story. And Ehud Barak, Shimon Perez, all of them have tremendous amount of Jewish blood on their hands and gave away Jewish land and wanted to surrender the whole country to our enemies. The scum of the earth, all of them. Thank you, Chicago Jew. And now we go to J.T. Eferis, who is relatively new to the forum, but asks very, very good questions, and J.T. Eferis once writes, and I quote, look, Board of Deputies of British Jews, who never heard of them, tell M.K. Betzalel Smotrich to bugger off. Smotrich, the board 
has been taken over by a progressive left-wing minority representing only two and a half people. Chaim, I'd like to hear your comment. Thank you, unquote. Well, this is a story we had before that uh, was also raised by um, by Ram. Um, the British, bo- the so-called British Board of Deputies, is is an organization of self-hating Jewish traitors of the worst type. By the way, the Jewish establishment in the United States is no better than them. These are Jews who, during the Shoah, during the Holocaust, had tremendous power and never used the power to save the Jews during the Holocaust. On the contrary, they used the power to fight against those Jews who were, Jewish activists who were trying to save the millions of Jews who were being murdered during the Holocaust. The so-called Board of Deputies is a hideous, extreme left, assimilated, self-hating organization of Judenrat Kapos. Yemach Shmam Bezichram Shem Reshayim Dier Kav. Thank you very much, J.T. Eferis. And now we go to Harel156, who writes, and I quote, De Chaim, I admire your vast knowledge of many subjects, historical, current events, and your your ability to accurately predict future events. How do you keep up with current events? Do you watch TV? If yes, what channels, internet, other forms of media you use? Do you read books and or newspapers? How much time do you allocate for acquiring this knowledge? I assume you go to synagogue three times a day. Can you tell us about your synagogue? How long are you there? What is the size of your daily minyan? Keep up the good holy work. Unquote. Um, first of all, I, Harel, I, I appreciate your, your compliment, but I don't think I have vast knowledge. I'm no genius, that's for sure. I don't have vast knowledge. Um, I try to keep up with events because that's part of... I think we all should try to keep up with what's going on, and, and I try to keep up with events. It's part of my job here. Uh, to do that, I say job in quotes. I don't have a job. I don't get paid for what I do. You know, I've, I've never gotten a salary, and I don't want a salary. Um, but um, I try to keep up, and I try. And, you know, do I watch TV? No, I don't. I do not. I do not have a TV. I don't watch TV. I have no TV. There's no TV in my house. I had TV when my mother was Zichron Ali Bracha Leah Hashalom when she was alive. She used to watch TV because she didn't know the internet. She was in her late 80s. But um, when my mother passed away, that was the end of the TV. I don't I don't watch TV or need it because the things you see on TV you can see on the internet. Um, internet, um, of course, you know you try to keep up with events and you try to go to news channels and you know. And uh, you you want to you you want to keep up with events. Newspapers, if I if I read newspapers, it's on again on the internet. Uh, and books, I'm interested in books on Judaism, on the Torah and Judaism. Um, and Harel asked me if I go to synagogue three times. A day. I do not go to synagogue three times a day. Uh, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, I try to go most of the week. I go for shacharit in the morning. And um, Mincha and Mariv depends. Depends. But I do not. I usually do not go three times a day. Usually not. Um, and the synagogue? No, I'm not at the synagogue. I'm just if I go to the synagogue, it's just for the. It's just. For, it's just for the. It's just for the for the Shmona Esrei for the Minyan. That's it. I and then I leave. Um. What is the size of your daily minyan? Um, sometimes there are not enough people to make up a minyan and we have to scramble to get the tenth person. We have to go out and ask people to come in. Sometimes we only have eight or nine people. Uh, and other times we have a hundred people. It, it varies. It varies drastically. Anyway, thank you very much, Harel. And Harel, you are a longtime friend of our movement and I thank you. And now we go to an, a really great person. Dan Ben Noach. Dan Ben Noach writes, and I quote, Shalom Chaim, please share what you would say if you were Prime Minister of Israel and you were asked to give a statement on Black Lives Matter to be heard not only by Israel, but by the world media and the Black Lives Matter movement itself. What makes a life matter and about what percentage of black lives actually do matter and why? What should public policy be regarding this group around the world? Thanks in advance. Respectfully, Dan Ben Noach. Um... Black Lives Matter is a racist, anti-Semitic, evil organization 
of criminals and degenerates and the scum of the earth, the lowest scum of the earth. Most of them are just are illegitimate, low life, and literally illegitimate. I mean, uh, you know, they 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 do not know who their daddy be. I mean, the lower they come from, broken families and low life, a low life community, and they're filled with hatred and envy toward anybody who who leads a decent life or has any morality or any decency, and. And that, and I would say that if I were the Prime Minister of Israel, they are the scum of the earth. And what percentage of black lives actually do matter? Well, um, black Jew haters' lives don't matter. If, if some, in fact, Jew haters' lives in general don't matter. They don't deserve to live, Jew haters. And um, people can judge for themselves how many blacks are Jew haters. Ninety-seven percent voted for Barack Hussein Obama. 93% voted for Al Sharpton when he ran for mayor of New York. 94% voted for Jesse Jackson when he ran for president of the United States. One million of them went to a so-called Million Man March with the black Hitler Louis Farrakhan. They're members of Congress whom they vote 95%. They vote for their members of Congress. The whole Congressional Black Caucus went to the Million Man March and supports Louis Farrakhan. To this day, they have what they call a sacred covenant with Louis Farrakhan. So people can judge for themselves uh, what black people think of whites and of Jews. Now, I do not hate every last person who is black, God forbid. I don't hate somebody. I, I, have, I couldn't care less about the color of their skin. Their skin color in no way interests me. I couldn't care less if someone's white, black, green, or purple. I only care if someone's righteous or evil. And the vast majority of black people have chosen to be evil. And that's why I detest them. I detest them because they're ungrateful, evil, jealous cockroaches. But the exceptions to the rule, blacks who are not anti-Semitic and not racist and not jealous and not evil, I have nothing against them. They can, they have free will. They could be righteous. It happens to be that the percentage of blacks who are righteous is very, very low. Very few just like the percentage of Arabs who are righteous is, 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 is a joke. But if there are exceptions to the rules, I'm not against them because of their race. I'm against them because they've chosen the path of wickedness. And the people who were good to them, the Jews, are the people they hate the most. Thank you, Dan Ben Noach. <clears throat> and, uh, oh, and you asked what public policy should be regarding this group around the world. They're a terrorist organization. They should be they should be outlawed as a terrorist organization. And if they come to if if I were prime minister and they came to Israel, I they'd be shot on sight as terrorists. Thank you, Dan Ben Noach. And now we go to uh, Joe Brandon, who writes, and I quote: One, do not take revenge. The Torah warns revenge is wrong. On the other hand, the very same Torah war- warns us not to take that, which warns us not to take revenge, describes God Himself as a vengeful God. How can this be? If we are told not to be vengeful, why is God then allowed to be? If revenge is immoral, how can God be vengeful? Please explain the Jewish view. Uh, You have to understand the difference between revenge that's justified and revenge that's not justified. The Torah also says you're not allowed, thou shalt not, thou shalt not murder. It doesn't say thou shalt not kill, by the way. It says thou shalt not murder. Um, There's a difference between killing someone who wants to kill you you're defending yourself as opposed to just going out and murdering an innocent person there's a difference between a war that's that's launched for cruel and evil and selfish reasons and a war that's launched in self-defense to protect your, your nation or your country against attackers and there's a difference between revenge against somebody for instance for petty reasons for instance, if someone comes to you and let's say you, you, you want to borrow a flashlight from your neighbor. And your neighbor says, no, I'm not going to give you the flashlight. No, I, no, I don't want to give you the flashlight. Uh, I need this flashlight. I don't want to get I don't, I don't want to. And then the next, the next day your neighbor comes to you and says, oh, can I, borrow, can I borrow this tool or this hammer or this other thing that I need? Your neighbor comes to you and says, huh, what, are you kidding me? 
You didn't give me the flashlight yesterday. Now you want me to give you the hammer? Now you want me to give you a tool? That we're not supposed to do. Okay? That's something that the average person would do. That's revenge. But that's petty revenge. That we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to be petty. And we're supposed to forgive people for things like that. On the other hand, um, someone who commits murder, we're supposed to avenge the blood of the innocent. And someone who, who, who desecrates God's name, we're supposed to avenge their blood. <clears throat> and you clearly see King David was got revenge against all types of enemies if you read the book of if you read the book of uh, Samuel and you read the book of the kings and you read uh, you see that 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 revenge is very much a commandment for the Jews to carry out revenge against their enemies they're required to carry out revenge against their enemies and David prays to God to give him the power and ability to carry out revenge against their en- against his enemies and that's in the psalms Tehillim, Sefer Tehillim in the book of Psalms. I mean, there's no question that revenge against evil, monstrous people that do evil, monstrous things is not only permitted, but a commandment. And we pray that God avenge people also because we can't, you know, sometimes we can't always do everything that we want to do, that we want to be able to do. So sometimes we pray for God to do it for us. For instance, I can't go out now and avenge many evil people that I would love to. Uh, believe me, I would love to do. There are a lot of people I would love to do things to. But um, I can't do it because then I'll, I'll go to jail for the rest of my life and then there'll be nobody here to help the hilltop youth and nobody here to, you know. And I, I, I'm not going to do it. So I'm going to be a law-abiding citizen, but I can pray to God to carry, out, to carry out the revenge against the evil people. Now Joe asks, too, what would you call the Flintstones if they were black? I know, Joe, what you want me to say. You want me to say that you would call them niggers. I know that's what you what you want me to say. Okay, you 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 got me to you got me to answer the question the way you want it. Thank you, Joe. And now we go to Italian Zionist, our good friend, who writes, and I quote: "Hi, Chaim. What is your opinion of the legacy of European clothing, food, and language on Ashkenazi Orthodox community?" The other day, I heard my friend talking on the telephone, and I and if I didn't know better, I would think he was speaking German. For goodness' sake. I do not want to offend my Orthodox brothers and sisters, but I can't understand why they're using European clothing of the 19th century. I recall that you once said they adopted the hats and clothing of their enemies. Even the word shul is German for school. I think it's insane to give a synagogue a German name. Um, I can't understand why they are using Yiddish German mostly. It is better to follow Sephardic traditions, in my opinion. What is your opinion of the German-Polish 19th century clothing Jews wear, the influence of German, Polish, Russian language and food on the Orthodox community. Thanks. Um, uh, no, I, I certainly agree with you. And 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 uh, you're referring though to basically the Hasidim and and certain sects of the Jewish community who were a minority, a small minority of the Jewish community. But you know, it's crazy. It's crazy that they continue. Uh, they continue to follow this. Uh, they turned the clothing that their enemies, uh, enemies of the Jewish people, anti-Semites who murdered Jews during the Holocaust. They turn this into something sacred. <laughs> it's, it's completely nuts. As far as Yiddish is concerned, Yiddish, um, even though it's, it, I know it sounds like German, and, and uh, believe me, I don't like to hear, I, I, I don't like to to hear that language uh, because be, uh, because of what happened in the Holocaust. Three fourths of my family and on, on my father's side were murdered during the Holocaust, so I certainly don't like to hear it. But uh, Yiddish. Um, and, and Yiddish is mostly German. But it is a language that the Jews spoke because they were forced to live in Europe. They didn't have anywhere else to go. No one else would take them, and they had to go from country to country, and they were expelled and murdered everywhere they went. And so they adopted a dialect or a language, or they actually adopted, created a language for themselves which would be their own language, but it was similar to German because at that time they were living, they were living under the control of the Germans. Um, and so that's why a lot of Jews, even in Russia, have German names because the Ger- when they lived in, in under German control in Germany, they were forced to adopt German names. Originally, Jews all had Hebrew names. All the Jews had Hebrew names when they first were, were, set, were sent into the exile. But but uh, the Germans forced them to take German names, and then eventually they took other names, Russian names, and so on. Um, there's no question that there are a lot of attributes from the 
from the galut, from the exile that the Jews have that, that are not positive ones uh, and that are very problematic and uh, you know I'm not happy with it but um, the Jews coming back to Israel those are the normal Jews and they're going to be normal they're going to have their own Hebrew language they, they, they have the Hebrew again I don't know why would Jews want to speak Yiddish instead of Hebrew? I mean, look, there were a lot of wonderful Jews who spoke Yiddish for a thousand years. The Jewish people were forced to speak, to speak a language, a European language when they lived in Europe. And so for a thousand years they spoke that language and a lot of magnificent Jewish saints spoke that language and, and so I respect Yiddish historically. But now Hebrew is the national language of the Jewish people and Jews should learn Hebrew. Every Jew should learn Hebrew.